Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Risk Management School. My name is Stephanie Rango, and I'm a member of the Pirani team. I'm excited to be here with you today to explore the theoretical and practical aspects of the different topics that we will see. To help us delve into this session, we're happy to have Ernesto here with us, um, who's going to discuss a couple of different topics. Um, hi, Ernesto. How are you today? Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you all bright eyed and bushy tailed. <laughs> uh, I know for some of you it is later in the afternoon, but nonetheless, I am very excited to show you guys what we have in store today. Cool. Um, and yeah, thank you so much, so, Stephanie, for that intro. Of course. Nice to see you. Um, before we begin, um, I wanted to invite everybody to learn about our risk management school by visiting the Pirani Academy, where you'll find valuable learning materials. Um, and we'll leave the link of the Pirani Academy in the chat. Thank you, Nicole. Um, and yeah, and finally, if you have any questions during the webinar, also just please feel free to ask them through the questions and sections down below, um, and we'll be happy to answer uh, them at the end of the webinar. Um, and also, I wanted to let you guys know about our very cool, cool project, um, our YouTube space. So if you guys want to learn more about um, what Pirani does and, you know, just watch more educational videos on us, we have a webinar, I'm sorry, we have a, a YouTube channel that we invite you to subscribe. We'll leave the link in, in the chat as well. Um, if Nicole will put that in there and yeah, we'll see you on YouTube. So now let's begin. Um, we'll, we're going to begin with the topic. So over to you, Ernesto. Thank you. Awesome. All right, guys. So yeah, today we're all gathered to learn how to make a risk management matrix. Now, I'm just going to let you guys know, I'm going to talk about this generally, because as we all know, there are various methods, tools, or or ways to create a matrix. So I'm really going to stick and focus to the, the foundational concepts we need to understand for embarking on this journey for making a risk management matrix. Now, if at any point, uh, as you know, my, my colleague Stephanie here mentioned that you want more information about risk management or how to make a risk management matrix or any other topics related to risk management, we really do uh, encourage you to take advantage of that academy. There's a lot of uh, valuable information there to you know, help you solve whatever issues you're, you're encountering on your risk management journey. Um, so yeah, and then on top of that, we also have a uh, YouTube channel dedicated to risk management and all, all that that encompasses. Uh, so yeah, I highly encourage you to subscribe. So whenever we have our latest video come out, you get notified right away. Now for today's agenda, this is what we have planned. So first off, we're gonna start out with learning the importance of risk management. And then what is a risk manage, what is a risk management matrix? And then why it's important? Why, what are the benefits of using this? Why is this such a, a popular thing within this field? And then we're gonna go into understanding how to create uh, a matrix. And then we're gonna go into some practical uh, examples uh, and, and cases here. And then if we have time, we will definitely round out the hour with some Q&A. So let's begin, guys. All right. So the importance of risk management. Uh, again, I know some of you are, are seasoned veterans in this space, but I'd like to make sure that we're all on the same page going into this. So uh, for us, risk management is a process used to identify potential risks and develop strategies to address and mitigate them. I mean, it's a very important part of any business and it's viable, it's vital, excuse me, for the long-term sustainability of their operations, you know, and, and for us here at Pirani, we, we really have two main uh, goals for doing risk management. It's one to reduce the uh, unexpected loss and ensure the security of your company's assets. Uh, but the one I really like to, uh, to align with is identify what areas are optimal for investment within the company. Um, and then ultimately, it's important for businesses to manage these risks effectively as it can help protect against those losses, the reputational damage, or any operational disruption. So this is why we, we, we specialize in this here. Now, I want to get the, the brain you know, uh, working here and, and thinking of some examples. Because uh, this is going to be very important for us uh, further down this this uh, presentation. So I have some good examples of risk management strategies implemented by companies. Uh, most notably for me, I'm a big outdoorsy guy. I love Patagonia, but I don't just love them for their materials. I love them because they have implemented a great risk management strategy in that if you buy anything 
from them, you can return it. If it's returned within the year, you get a full cash refund. If it was returned after a year, you still get uh, the equal the equivalent value back in store credit. Uh, so that way you can get a, you know a, a, an exact replica of what you originally had in case your your coat ripped or your backpack has a strap that tore off. They're they're making sure that their reputation uh, stays top tier amongst amongst the outdoors community. And then on top of that, they also have made it like their mission to make sure that anything that they invest in outside the company is very eco-friendly related, which again, just helps with the perception of the company uh, from an outsider's point of view. Now, another good example of risk management uh, that a lot of restaurants implement, or at least should, is have like a, a quality assurance person on their line, making sure that every dish, once it's finished, is actually cleaned up, made correctly, and going out to the correct person. I used to work in the restaurant industry a lot, actually. And uh, you want this guy to be your best friend because, you know, you want to make sure nobody's spitting in your food, you know. Um, but yes, so these are some good examples. Now, let's take a look at some bad examples here. All right. So most recently, if you haven't heard the news, there was a very big freight company in the U.S. that went bankrupt. Uh, now, there's a lot of reasons that, that you know, result in the bankruptcy, which means ultimately their risk management strategies failed. Uh, which is not good because now all these other companies that are relying on them for their materials or their services uh, can no longer rely on them and need to go look elsewhere. And then uh, I'm a huge crypto guy. I don't know if you guys <laughs> are, but for me, I was devastated at the collapse of FTX. Um, thankfully, I wasn't affected too greatly. But yes, they, they went bankrupt because they were taking these massive risky bets in the market uh, and played with their customers' deposits. That's you know obviously not a good strategy, especially if you're not considering the risk to reward ratio there. And ultimately, stuff like this happens when that is not taken into account. So now that I've given you guys some good examples and some bad examples here, definitely start writing in the chat uh, what what some good examples or bad examples you've personally seen or you would come up with in in business that you you currently work in. Um, so yeah, let's let's see that chat blow up. All right. And while that's going on here, uh, we're going to go into what is a, mix, a, a risk matrix. Now, I know it's a it, it's it's going to vary based on again if you're doing this by hand. I know some people who do create these risk matrices by hand. Some people prefer to use Excel, uh, and other people have like some third party software that they use. So again, I'm just going to talk generally here. Uh, because it, it, it can look different from organization to organization. So a, a risk management tool is something that's used to identify, assess, and quantify your company's risks. You know, it helps visualize and prioritize your risks based on their likelihood and potential impact. And then ultimately, why we create these matrices is that it helps managers and you know the personnel to make decisions on how to act when faced with those risks that are most likely to happen. Uh, so this is a good game plan or a good, you know, I, I, I guess in a sense a checklist for some people to make sure that when X happens, you do Y. That is what a risk matrix is, and and what its ultimate goal is to do for you. Now, what are some of the benefits of a risk matrix? I mean, there, there are a lot of benefits, but the three I really like to focus on is that one, it helps with the prioritization of those risks. Um, that way you stay organized. Because again, you know, as we all know, there are risks that are very likely to happen and those that are very unlikely to happen with varying degree of impact. Um, and so if you have your things that are most unlikely to happen at the top and always at your point of mind, you're going to forget the ones that are most likely to happen. Uh, and that's not a good thing. So this helps you organize and keep in mind like, okay, okay, hey, daily, these are the ones we need to look out because they're the ones that happen the most frequently. Uh, now, the second reason I really like using a risk matrix is because it helps with the improved decision making within an organization. You know, oftentimes when something happens, we're very reactive. We don't have a plan or a set person who's responsible uh, for taking on that risk. Um, this risk matrix helps you do that. It already predetermines what is supposed to happen and who is supposed to be the one in charge once that risk actually takes place. 
And then ultimately, it helps with enhanced communication across your organization. Uh, because the benefit of a risk matrix is not only is it uh, something uh, visible that you can look at, it's also something you can share with other people, talk about. Uh, one thing I really like about risk matrixes is, is that you also often have to get a team together to talk about risks that you know they're expecting. And just that communication and that dialogue of understanding your day-to-day -day operations and the obstacles you're going to be facing just perhaps helps uh, remove that obstacle to, you know, potentially, you know, going into chaos, you know, everybody's just screaming, running around with like a chicken without their heads, you know, that's not something we want. We want people, you know, that are organized and know what to do in that situation. So these are the benefits. And if you have any other benefits that you think of, definitely put it in the chat. Again, you know, the more the more we share here, the better off I think everybody in this community will be. And in the meantime, I definitely want to I'll let you guys know uh, what makes up a risk matrix generally. So a risk matrix is made up of, you know, as we've all guessed it, risks. Then followed by mitigation strategies or controls, as we like to put it sometimes. They can be interchangeable. Sometimes they're separate. Again, it's going to depend on your organization. And then lastly, you're going to want to consider the likelihood and impact of each scenario. Uh, this is going to be very important, again, with the organization of how those risks are going to line up within your risk management matrix. And then ultimately, I think this is very important to note before you even begin creating a risk matrix. It's you want to understand the context or the framework that you want to work with when creating this risk management matrix. So, for example, you have some ISO standards, um, some COSO frameworks. Uh, there, there are a couple other frameworks out there. Um, and yeah, definitely, if you have a framework you want to share in the chat, definitely put it in there. Because um, I feel like there's so many out there that people get overwhelmed. Um, but the more we see, you know, these new naming, uh, these namings of uh, frameworks, the more aware we'll be, and we can potentially implement within our, our companies. All right. So now we're getting to the real meat and potatoes here of, of today's webinar, creating a risk matrix. All right. So ultimately, like I said, the most important thing is understanding your context or your, your framework. Once you've identified that framework, you're going to want to identify your risks. Okay. So taking into account the scope and context of your processes within a company, um, you're going to want to, you know, understand are there natural disasters that are going to be happening uh, within you know your area? Is there going to be you know some supply chain issues that you you could potentially foresee? You know these are things we need to account for, and especially if you're working in in tech, you know understanding how your data is stored, how it's kept, making sure that security that the data security is up to date, very important these days. So again, this is where you definitely want to start brainstorming. This is where you're going to start. You know, thinking about your your risks that you'll be facing. So, definitely share some stuff in the in in the chat here about any of those risks that you're you're seeing in your day to day. All right. Now, step two is going to be addressing the likelihood and impact of these risks. Now, the typical standard for doing something like this is creating a five by five grid. Um, I have seen three by threes. Um, that's another common one. Uh, but again, it's going to depend on your organization and how your team wants to uh, move forward with your risk matrix. Now, um, like we see here in the standard five by five, we have our impact on one end and likelihood on the other. Those can be interchangeable. They don't have to be like you see here on uh, on this graphic here, you can flip them. You can change what sides you are. It's not, uh, how do I say, set in stone. What's most important, though, is understanding your, your categorization, categorization within each of those lines. Okay. So uh, once we have assessed our likelihood and impact of these risks, the next thing we're going to want to do is go ahead and define your mitigation strategies and create your controls. So, for example, um, you know, whenever, let's say, 
we're running uh, a financial services company, you know, we need to understand, okay, what happens if uh, I'm working with a customer uh, or a client for the financial services company who's, you know, working with investing uh, into the stock market? You know, we need to make sure that in case, you know, the, the value of their, their portfolio goes down, that we have some ways of, uh, how do I say, being available for them because they're going to come in with questions. So you definitely want to have a customer service department there and you want to have, uh, how do I say, controls there to like, okay, hey, you know, I totally understand, you know, you're, you're, you're worried about the state of things. You know, you can set up an appointment with your portfolio manager here or whatnot. That's a control. That's something you can do to uh, help the person calm down from the fact that, hey, I'm feeling very emotional right now. Um, and there, there are various uh, uh, other examples we can go into, but I definitely would love to see in the chat uh, some examples that you're working with. Okay. No worries. I know there's a bit of a delay here, but Another another example I like for controls is let's say we're working with uh, another client who, let's say, can't afford our services after you know we've worked for them for a while. Uh, a good control we can put is implementing a payment plan strategy. This way we can ensure that one we we have that relationship and that business with that client still, and also have a way of getting the money for our services. It may not be ideal for us, you know. Obviously, we'd want all the money up front, but getting it. Uh, in, in parts is better than not getting it at all. And that helps mitigate the, the damage to us financially uh, and operationally. Let's see here, there we go. So putting it all together. Once we've identified our risks and we've ident uh, associated its likelihood and its impact to the organization and then implemented any controls or mitigate case and strategies, to that risk, it'll look something like this. And again, this is just a general overview of what a risk matrix can look for you. But regardless of how you make your risk matrix, uh, some really good uh, best practices I recommend is one, use colors. As you can see, this helps you see like what, what risks are very low priority and which ones are very high priority. It's a very quick, easy way to understand. Next. Uh, I really, really, uh, uh, how do I say, uh, urge you to do uh, regular updates because the world's always changing. There are always, you know, new risks popping up, new technologies, new new ways of doing things, and because of that, that's going to result in more risks for the company. So you want to make sure this is regularly updated, um, and that doesn't necessarily mean you always have to add things to your risk matrix. Sometimes things get phased out, like videotapes. You know, who watches movies on videotapes anymore? You know, very few people. Um, so that's, you know, that's just an example of something that's been faded out of the world that used to be, you know, very popular with all of us. Uh, another really good best practice tip I can give you is just involve your stakeholders. The more people you can get involved uh, within a certain process, uh, the better and more accurate your risk matrix will be. Uh, and then ultimately, again, just monitoring and reviewing these risk matrices is is just uh, an ongoing thing. It's like showering. You got to do it every day. You got to you got to make sure that it's it's maintained because if you don't whenever something happens and you haven't updated it, what was the point of investing all those working hours into creating this risk matrix? So that is how you create a risk management matrix. Now, I understand that some of us may be new to the game and don't have uh, a way uh, or a method of creating a risk management matrix. Uh, but thankfully, that's where Pirani comes in. We actually have a, a free version of our software that's uh, not requiring any credit card to sign up with. All you need is your email. And as you can see, the people who use our software love us. Uh, we have a lot of really good reviews on G2 and Captera. Uh, that, that show how easy and friendly we are to use for people working within risk management. So uh, if you want, uh, definitely go to our website and actually I'll have Nicole or Stephanie drop the link for the free version of our software for you to sign up because uh, I'm going to show you how you can actually create a risk management matrix within the software. So I'll give you guys a couple minutes to get that started while I also navigate over there. 
So just bear with me. Awesome. All right, I'm going to give you guys a couple more minutes here because I know it's going to take a, a little bit of time for you guys to, to log in to the software. But I'll just give you a general overview here of what the software is like. Um, I don't know why this thing's up here. Come on. There we go. There we go. All right. So what we're going to do is every time we come into the software, you're always going to be greeted by your risk heat map. So the more you do on, on the software, I mean, the more risks and processes that you add, it's all going to show up here at first glance. And one thing I really love about Ferrani software is that it's intuitive. And I say that because whenever you first enter, I know it can be a little intimidating. You're like, where the heck do I start? Um, and the great thing is, is that to start, it's like a funnel. All you got to do is start at the top and work your way down. And that's what we're going to do here when we're adding things uh, to create our risk matrix. And I do want to clarify something here. Oftentimes, people get confused. They think this, this heat map here is the matrix. It's actually not. Um, it is part of the matrix. Uh, so they're not completely wrong when they assume that. But really, the matrix for Pirani is everything you see here. So this menu with all of these, these um, sections and the heat map. So ultimately, the heat map is just the visual component of the risk matrix. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and show you guys how we can start creating our risk matrix within Pirani. Now, to begin, like I said, we're just going to start at the top. We need to identify our process, OK? So with Pirani, our philosophy here when it comes to processes is that your process is going to be your context. And the best way to do that is associating your what we call macro processes with the departments uh, within your organization. And what you're going to do is, like you saw there, you're going to click on the green button uh, on the on the right hand corner. And you're going to get this menu that pops up. OK, so what I like to do first is come here to my category because this helps me determine what level of process I'm working with. And I can go into more detail of how the most processes work, but that's going to be like a whole nother webinar. Um, but if you want, definitely check out our YouTube. Uh, we actually have a webinar uh, going over processes way more in depth. Um, so just for the sake of time, I'm just going to go ahead and work with a macro process here, which again is like the department within your organization. So let's say, again, we're running like a, an accounting firm or a financial services firm. It's going to be a macro process here. And this department is going to be our client services. OK. Now, for type, we have three options to select here. Your missional, your strategic, and your supporting. Now, just a quick overview here of what that means. Your missional statements are your processes that are core to the business. Like, this is what the business does uh, type of, of processes. Next, you have your strategic. Your strategic processes, those are more for things that help the, uh, how do I say, uh, execution of your missional statements or your missional processes, excuse me there. Uh, so things like that could be like, uh, let's say we're, we're running a, a pizza company, okay? And we need help selling these pizzas because ultimately our mission is to make and sell pizzas. And so our strategic process here could be something like marketing or creating a promotion to help sell more of those pizzas. And then our third option here is our supporting types of processes, which are ultimately things within the organization or processes within the organization that help other departments work. So this could be something like your customer support department, your customer success department, something like that, or operations, uh, just making sure that everyone's you know working and removing blockers. Uh, for other departments in the company or processes or whatever. So for us, let's say we're going to go ahead and say this is our missional statement, like client services. People come to our accounting firm or financial services firm uh, you know, for help with their finances. That is what we're here to do. And so 
you can type a, a quick description here, something like help people with their finances. Again, you can go as in depth as you want here when you create these. Once you finish this part, all you're going to do is click on create. All right. And once it's created, it's actually going to appear at the very bottom here. So anytime you add a new process, it's always going to be added to the bottom. All right. Once we've created our process, the next thing we're going to want to do, or actually, uh, I'll give you guys a couple of minutes here. Uh, I'll give you like a, a couple seconds here, excuse me, to, to finish that up, because I know I might be moving a little fast. Um, yes, once you finish your process, the next thing we're going to do is continue moving down the list. So next, we're going to go to risks. So we're going to click on that. Awesome. And we're going to see an overview of our risks. Now, some, some things I want us to note here right off the bat is that you're going to have your risks name and you're going to have these two columns here, your inherent risks and your residual risks. Now, just to give you a brief overview of what that means, because again, we have other videos that go more into depth on this on our YouTube channel. Uh, so I, again, I really, really urge you guys to check those out if you have questions regarding uh, anything you see here. But yes, inherent risk is basically like once you first input the risk without any controls, without any mitigation strategies associated with it, that's going to be its inherent, uh, uh, how to say, risk level. Then once you've started associating controls and mitigation strategies uh, and associated with the risk, then you're going to look at the column for residual risk to see how that those controls and mitigation strategies affect that risk. Does it lower it? Obviously, we hope it does. <laughs> now, how do we create a risk? What we're going to do is we're going to go over here and click on create risk in the upper right hand green button. All right. Now, the cool thing here is that you can either decide to type it in manually uh, if you already know your risks. Uh, if you don't know of a risk and need help with that, we actually have an integration with ChatGPT. So to do that, you just click on that green text that says suggest a risk, select your industry and select your process, uh, and that will help GPG generate uh, a, a risk for you. Now, for the sake of simplicity, though, I'm going to go ahead and create something manual here. So let's say, again, just to provide context here, we're, we're running like an accounting firm or a financial services type of industry, and we're working within our client services department. So a risk we need to uh, account for is what happens if, let's say, a client defaults. What we're going to do is type in the name of the risk, right? Then we need to determine its impacts, okay? And again, this is going to be uh, determined by you and your stakeholders or your risk management team. So this is where that communication is very important. Um, this is something that's very critical to us. Um, because obviously if we're working for someone and they're not paying us, that's going to be a problem. What's the likelihood of this kind of thing? Well, uh, again, you, you need to determine that with your, with your company. Um, but it's likely it's something that's very likely, um, for, for us. Cause we, if we have a lot of clients and, you know, we don't know them that well, uh, or, you know, just with the inherent unpredictability of our economy these days, this is something that is on the table for us. And then you can go into further detail of that here and explain as to why you you created things the way they are and or rated things the way they are in terms of your impact and likelihood. And then lastly, what you need to do is determine how you're going to address this risk. There are four options here. You have your acceptance, you have your transfer, mitigation, and avoidance. Accepting risk is just like, hey, this is life. You know, we're not going to do anything about it. Transfer risk is like, hey, um, we want to get a, an insurance policy from another company to cover us in case we have a lot of defaults, kind of like how the FDIC works within the US. Uh, so that's one way. Uh, you can have mitigation strategies where, let's say, to avoid these uh, this uh, likelihood or impact of a default, let's ask for some money up front before we even work with the person, have like a, a deposit or a retainer. That's something that helps mitigate that risk of, hey, they defaulted. Now how we're, we're you know, 
financially vulnerable and helps mitigate that. And then avoidance, which is in this case, something like, hey, let's just not do business with them at all. <laughs> or yeah, I mean, that's, that's basically how that, that would translate. So definitely think here, you know, as to how, how your context uh, would, would work with how you want to uh, address the, the risk. Now, for the sake of this, con uh, this demonstration, I'm just going to go ahead and go with mitigation. All right. Now, once I create mitigation, I'm going to go over here, the processes, because I need to associate this risk with the process. So once I come over here to the processes uh, tab on the menu, I'm going to go ahead and click on the green associate button. And what you're going to see is a list of all my processes that we made. Okay. And then remember, we were making something for client services. So to associate this, uh, this risk with this process, what we're going to need to do is go ahead and click on this associate process button here. It's like this green paperclip looking icon. So all we need to do is simply click on that and it's associated. All right. So, yep, we got the confirmation number. We're going to go to return. All right, and I'm just going to double check here, make sure everything's filled out. Because again, anything asterisk means you need to complete that in order for this to be saved. So awesome, it is saved. And once we've finished this, notice we have a preview of how this risk is going to appear within our risk heat map. So this is where it, where it stands. And again, I haven't created any controls. So if I create a control and associate it with this risk, this is going to move and you're going to see uh, a, a, another set of initials uh, for how uh, they label it as a, a uh, how do I say, a residual risk. So I'm going to go ahead and create. There we go. All right. So next thing we're going to do is go over to controls. All right. So once we hit, go over and navigate to the controls section here, what we're going to notice is a couple of things. Obviously, first thing we're going to see is our control name. We're also going to see how it's rated or how, uh, you know, based on your criteria, how solid and how effective this control is associated with its risk. Now, to create a risk, what we're going to do is, again, click on the green button over here for create control. We're going to get another menu that pops up. And here, we're going to need to input our information. So again, with the context of, hey, we're working in a financial services company, or we're working within the department of client services, and where we have a risk of clients defaulting. What is a control that we can implement to negate that impact and likelihood of it happening? Well, as I mentioned before, let's ask for a deposit or a retainer up front. That way we get some money uh, for our services. And give me a sec. Oof, your throat. Oof, there we go. Way better. All right. So we're going to type that in. So we're going to say uh, acquire a deposit up front. All right. And then we're going to go ahead and rate how our controls work in this situation. So what is what kind of uh, uh, quality control is this? Is this corrective, detective, or preventative? Well, again, this is going to be subjective to you and your team for whatever control you're creating. Um, but yeah, for us in this situation, I would say it's preventative because we are trying to completely eliminate that risk of completing all our services and then not getting any money for it. So I'm going to go ahead and hit 100%. Next type of execution. Is this something that's manually done? Is it combined? Is it automatic? You know, let's say we have a invoicing software that we use for our clients to collect those those uh, deposits. That's a combined type of uh, of action because one, you know, obviously we need to send the, the 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 invoice, but the ability to collect and send a receipt for the transaction can be done by the software. So in this case, I'm going to consider it combined. Is this control uh, executed repeatedly? Yes, because we're doing this for all clients and sometimes clients work with you multiple times. And if and this is the way we're gonna wanna operate moving forward, so most certainly, is this documented? 
yes, because, you know, we, we're trying to keep, we're an accounting firm. We have to keep documents, you know. If we don't, the SEC might be, might, might be angry with us. <laughs> All right, well, let me go down here. It is documented. Is there any evidence? Yes, you certainly want to have evidence in this situation, because, again, we don't want the SEC or the Federal Trade Commission coming after us or anything like that. And then are there assigned control owners? Again, this will be up to your organization if you want to assign someone an, an owner. But in this case, we won't have a specific person because every CPA or person within the client services department will have their own book of business, let's say. All right, next we're going to go to ex execution. And we're going to see uh, this you know, uh, quality control criteria here. So have these events been pre presented? Meaning, hmm. oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. My voice is giving out on me. <laughs> All right, have events been presented? Um, well, so when we say events, it's like, hey, has this risk actually happened and affected your, your company? Uh, due to the exist, I mean, how do I, let me re take a step back here. So since the implementation of this control, have events, risk events that have happened been, uh, how do I say, uh, done in real life or not? Meaning, did your control work or not is essentially how it, how it, uh, how it translates or has it negated any effect from a risk event related to the risk that this control is trying to mitigate, if that makes sense. Again, if you need me to clarify, put it in the chat. Um, Cause I know it's a little uh, conceptual there. Um, but yeah, thankfully for us, no. Because we keep asking for deposits, no risk events related to defaults have uh, presented themselves to us during this time. Is the design effective? Yes. Because again, we're just asking for the money up front or at least enough money to cover you know, our, our costs front and then is the evidence effective of this working of course yes so once that's all done you're going to go ahead and you need to associate this control with a risk so we're going to go over here to your risks and again click on the green associate button all right and then we're going to need to find our let's see where was it client default I would assume it'd be on the first page, but it might be on the second. There it is at the very bottom. All right. And we're going to associate that risk. Once again, we get the confirmation number, we need to return because here we're going to rate how this control is uh, working for this risk. So here we have these movable bars that let us know how we're going to rate this. Oh, excuse me. So how does this mitigate impact? It mitigates impact massively. Let's say 85% because we ask for 85% of the total value of our, our services up front or so forth. Mitigate likelihood. I would say that's a very strong likelihood of it mitigating the risk of a customer defaulting and not paying us because uh, we're getting the money up front again. So once we've associated that, we're gonna go ahead and hit create. Wonderful. Now, once we've created our process, our risk, and our control, now we can take a look at our heat map and see how this worked out. So again, you go to your dashboard. In your dashboard, you're going to see the See More button down here. Wonderful. All right. Now, when you get to your dashboard, I mean, when you get to the, uh, the, the detailed view of your heat map, you're gonna see some options here. Um, I'm gonna keep it simple and just stick to inherent risks. I'm gonna show you the residual here in a sec. But again, remember where, when we had our risk for this exercise here, I put it here uh, because again, when we were typing in all the criteria for that risk, it showed us that preview that it would be in this quadrant here. So if we wanna check on it, we just go over here and we see how it's been placed. Now, oh, excuse me. Now, if we want to check the residuals, anything in the in the white dot or the white circles, those are your residual risks. So, oh, sorry, working on the wrong one there. There we go. So again, 
So if we go here to client default, when you click on that risk, you're going to see the original in inherent risk. But once you in implement your uh, your controls, it's going to show you where it now lies within the risk heat map, uh, which now we can see as something that's uh, going to be rather an unlikely event to happen and have significant impact, but not be as critical as it originally was without our control of asking for those deposits. So that is how you create a risk matrix within our Pirani software. Uh, I definitely want to know, do you guys have any questions? Uh, yeah, I guess now we can go into our Q&A. Come on, guys. Thank I'm, I'm friendly. I don't bite. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Anissa. That was great. Um, I enjoyed everything. Um, I hope everyone's been learning a lot. Um, I wonder if we have any questions. Let's see. I know Nicole has been answering some stuff for anybody. Um, let's see. Any questions? Let's see. I don't see any Q&A questions as of yet. Okay. No worries. Hmm. All right. Well, does anybody have any examples that they want to see Ernesto, you know, play into the the uh, the solution? Perhaps like a certain risk or a control that you guys want to backtrack and see how else, um, you know, it can go into your everyday. Or do you have any other examples, Ernesto, that perhaps you can show them? Yeah, sorry, my, my voice is about to get out. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. No worries, though. Um, um, hold on, let's see. Um, okay, we have here someone. Okay, hi, Thurman, how are you? And Samuel, thank you. Um, so we can do two things. We can either do an Uber example or a climate change risk. Okay, let's let's um go a little bit into what Simwell said, which was uh, about the climate change risk. How would you you know implement that in the in the software, Simwell? Like what 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 kind of okay? Yeah. So if it's a climate change risk, I guess let's go back to the climate to the risk um, page. Of course. Okay, so climate change would be a risk. Climate and what risk. would be oh, a control, okay. right? So let's, I guess, show them how would we input the climate change risk. And then. Um, okay. Yeah. So cool. let's say we're working with a climate change risk. That's, yeah, we can start off with that. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So again, we're going to go in down to risks. Sorry, let me, let me go ahead myself there. Yeah. So we're just going to come down here to risks. Once again, click on this green button for creating risk. And once we go in there, all right, let's say, yeah, okay, we're working with climate change. Climate change risk. Okay. How is this going to impact us? Um, and again, this is going to be something that's going to be up to, you know, your organization um, and, and your time frame here. That's an important thing we, we all need to consider is like, what is our time frame that we're working with then? So if we're saying, okay, this is a, a climate change risk for, let's say we're a hotel on the beat, okay? And we're worried about climate change because the ocean will keep rising and eventually, you know, flood our, our hotel. Uh, I know in Florida, this is a, an issue for some some areas. Uh, so they have to keep, you know, uh, shipping in containers of sand to make sure that the, the sea doesn't rise and go into all these hotels. So that's that's a yearly thing. So that's a very critical or catastrophic even uh, a, a event. Uh, if you're, I'm, if again, you got to consider your context here, because uh, let's say you are, I don't know, somewhere up in the mountains, you know, you're not really worried about, you know, sea levels rising that rapidly within a year. Um, again, you got to, you got to think of your, your, your context here. So I'm going to work from the context of that. Or Samuel, do you have a context you want us to work within uh, for this risk? Okay. Um, Helsey said, in your point of view, how often should a company revise the risk matrix? If a process has changed, maybe it should be, uh, I'm sorry, maybe it should, but is there a period of time? Yeah, great question. I mean, honestly, I would suggest something like that orderly, uh, just because, you know, in, in the world of business, I'm talking like from a corporate point of view too. Um, I don't know your industry specifically, Helsey. Uh, but if if you're working in like a, a corporate America type setting, 
um, you know, I would suggest either every six months or something uh, quarterly. Somewhere in, in that is generally a sweet spot. Um, right. But if if you're not in corporate, I would definitely say like six months then. That would be a, a, a good uh, time frame for reevaluating okay. your risk matrix. Um, but yeah, Samuel, uh, rise input prices. And we had okay. a question from Annie. She says, um, if I need to create a risk matrix to get started in risk management, what would you say? I mean, it doesn't help. I mean, it's definitely a, a key skill for risk management. Um, so, you know, however you can start getting your, your, your experience within the field, I suggest do it. So if that means making a risk management matrix, then yes. Um, and the great thing, again, is Ronnie's free to use. You know, you can... Mm -hmm. You know, show if you're uh, interviewing for for other risk management positions down the road, uh, having this free software and having the, you know uh, something to show your interviewer, like, hey, you know, I make risk management matrices. Here's my thought process and how it works. Um, here's my criteria for why I've ranked things the way they are. You know, to an employer, that's going to show ambition. It's going to show that hey, you know, she's thinking the way you know we want them to think. Uh, Assuming you know you you you're you're aligned with the the field that you're going into, um, so yes, I suggest like if you're trying to get started, start creating, start thinking, start start getting that muscle worked because uh, it will just help you down the road. Uh, but yeah, let's go back to the climate change risk. Uh, so I do want to finish this for you guys. Um, so yeah, Samuel, can you provide us a, a little bit more context here related to climate change risk? Like, is there a specific industry that you're working in? or a specific process that you're looking at. Because um, otherwise I'll just make something up general and we'll go with my hotel example, if that's okay. Yeah, just to um, answer one of our um, audience's questions, Thurman, actually, uh, is it, or just to answer your question, is it free beyond the free trial? Um, so what we're doing is we have a freemium right now. And right now you can log into our website and go into the starter, pack, which would be under labeled under the freemium. You'll be able to kind of go in there and play with the sandbox and stuff like that. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah, we do um, every two weeks. Sorry, what is this? Yeah, that's what it is. So um, the freemium plan right now, we, you can go on the website and you can do, you can get started on the starter pack. Yeah, yeah, yeah just to go back welcome. to the climate change risk here and, and, and finish this out. Um, so yeah, like obviously if the whole ocean's coming into your hotel, that's going to be catastrophic. Uh, what is its likelihood? You know, if you're again on the coast in Florida where they're, you know, in certain areas trying to bring in sand to prevent the sea from rising, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very likely to likely scenario uh, that you're dealing with. Uh, so this is where, again, you'll get that preview of where it lies on the, on the risk matrix. Uh, and then this is your treatment. How are you going to, how are you going to mitigate this risk or control this risk? Um, so again, here in Florida, they're going to bring truckloads of sand to the beach to try to raise the, the, the beach level and, and prevent the, the sea from rising. So we're going to go with that. It's going to be a mitigation type of treat. Um, so yeah, that once that's created, we're going to associate that with the process. Um, assuming we have created a process here. Uh, let's say it's a management process. So we're going to go ahead associate it and just make sure everything's good so take a double and i think check. that I was, we had um and then hit create i think a control ju and just to kind of say because i know that you you know took the time to do the climate change risk to show everyone um and i think mm -hmm. a control for this climate ch a risk would be sustainability politics that was something that we were, um, you know, that would be considered a control. So, you know, you would go in there and put that in Correct. the inside the control. Yeah. Um, and then with that, because I know we have just a couple of minutes just left. But yeah, um, if anybody has any other last uh, questions. And then also, I did want to tell everybody um, a little bit about at the end of the the webinar, um, we're going to send you guys a little seminar, I'm sorry, a survey, so that way you guys can answer a couple of questions regarding what you liked in the webinar, if there's anything that you wanted us to, um, you know, bring up next webinar, 
and any feedback, advice, or or just comments, suggestions, we're all open to it. Um, if you guys could just give us that little one minute after the webinar um, and take a, a brief look at the survey. But yes, controls, um, that's what we were talking about just now, right? We're just getting the controls. So yeah, if we, if we wanted to add uh, sustainability politics as a control, we certainly can. So we'll just go into the controls again, type in sustainability politics. All right. And I know we have a couple of minutes here, so I'll have to fly through this. But again, we had to go through our control design criteria here. So control type, uh, this is preventative in, in some cases or, well, you know, it, it depends obviously on, on the type of politics here. So um, now just for simplicity sake, I'll say it's preventative. Type of execution, this is something that's manual. It's politics, you know, you got to talk to people. You have to get things, you know, worked in person a lot of times. Uh, is this control repeated, executed repeatedly? Yes, this is an ongoing thing. The politics will never end. <laughs> to, you know, for better or for worse, that's just one of those things that that will will, will be in existence. <laughs> is it documented? Um, yes, it, it is something that's documented because again, they're creating their politics, their policies, it's, and writing it out for everybody to see and, and enforcing it. Uh, is there evidence? Yes. Are there assigned control owners? Uh, depending on the legislation, again, for for the sake of this exercise, I'll just go ahead and say yes. All right, execution. All right, here are our criteria here. Have events been presented? Uh, so yeah, there are times where sometimes a policy gets enacted and it doesn't work. Um, that's just the way the world works sometimes, you know? Um, but again, that just means you have to go back to the process of politics and try to get a new regulation created or taken away. And just so, uh, you know, the, the quality of the issue gets resolved in a better way. Is it effective? Again, that'll be up to you and your organization here. I like to think, yes, they are effective. Uh, is the evidence effective? Uh, yes, I would like to say it is also effective. Uh, so here we have our final rating here, and then we're just going to need to go ahead and associate it with the risk. Again, it's going to be the last one because we just created it. Climate change risk, click on the associate risk. There we go. But then we have to do the toggles. Remember that, guys. We have these bars that we need to adjust. So what is the mitigation of impact for sustainability politics? I'll, I'll give it an 80. Does it mitigate its likelihood? Uh, I don't know. It's one of those things, again, it's going to be up to you guys. I'm going I'm to give it 50-50. All right. So once that's done, you're just going to hit Create. There we go. We're going to go back to our risks here real quick. So I need to see where it landed on. And again, if you, if you don't remember where it lies, you can always just go back into the Edit Risk and go back to your matrix here. See where it, where it's where it's at. Oops, I got so many bars. Sorry, guys. There we go. Cool. So then we can go to our dashboard. See more. And see where it lies. So if we click here, we're going to see climate change risk right there. And then if we want to see how its residuals are or how its residuals work, we're going to go ahead and click on this again. And we can see how the inherent risk is. And once we implement the control, where it lies on our risk matrix. So thank you so much, guys. Uh, it, it was a pleasure getting to teach you guys how to make a, a risk management matrix within Pirani. Uh, I hope you found it very valuable. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll hand over the mic to, to Stephanie here. Um, and thank you, Stephanie, so much for, for hosting this. Thank you, Ernesto. You did an amazing job explaining everything to us. So thank you again. Um, I hope this was educational for everybody. And I hope you guys enjoyed uh, the webinar that we put together for you today. And as I mentioned before, um, please don't forget to um, go inside the survey at the end of the webinar and answer a couple of questions for us. Um, and yeah, and I do want to um, talk about Helsey. I know that you had a question. What we're going to do is, because I know we're running out of time, we're going to send you an email with um, that answer okay um and then everyone else uh, we'll see you in the next webinar and again if you have any questions feel free to always reach out to ernesto or myself um, and we'll see you next time thank you so much have a good day take care guys bye